our final speaker is the co-president of the African American Historical Society, Carolyn Baker. She's co-president along with Diane Petaway, who is at the table over there selling our books and t-shirts, and I hope you'll say hi to Diane as well. Carolyn is going to talk about um, another building that no longer exists that was right next door to where John Ragazzino grew up, um, right across the street from the clock factory called Lillian's Paradise. And she'll tell you about her special connection that developed through this project to Lillian's Paradise. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see everyone in person, outside, and the weather is agreeing with us. So thank you for being here. I have the privilege of talking about Lillian's Paradise, and I wish I had been able to visit it. It no longer exists, but it's a story of a woman who really represented the whole story of the Great Migration. She came to the New Haven area with a dream of seeing her name in lights. And she came from Opelika, Alabama, where she knew her dream would never be realized. So she arrived here and with a theme that her daughter told me about. And she said she wanted to be her own boss, keep the faith, and run the race. And I think that's a good theme for all of us to adopt keep the faith and run the race. So she started on Dixwell Avenue in New Haven with a restaurant, which was very successful. Dixwell Avenue at that time in the late 30s, early 40s, was a bustling community of entrepreneurs. Her restaurant unfortunately burned down, but did she, keep, uh, she did not give up. She kept the faith and she kept running. And she opened Lillian's Paradise, not with a lot of ease. It was very difficult in the mid-40s for an African-American woman to open a restaurant nightclub that required a liquor, a liquor license. So she had to really uh, navigate the water, so to speak, to get all of that to happen, but she did. And she opened it in, uh, night, in October of 1946. I found uh, articles in an old Hartford newspaper announcing her grand opening and what she would be serving. And her menu included steak dinners for $2.50. So at this restaurant, which was also a nightclub, she attracted the best. She wanted the best jazz musicians in the world to come to New Haven, where she hoped uh, her Lillian's Paradise would become the center for jazz on the East Coast, and it did. So it was a beautiful restaurant and nightclub with great food. It seated 200 people. Many organizations met there. It was like uh, the banquet facility. So a lot of the women's organizations met there. I found an article about the New Haven Business and Professional Women's Club who held their first dinner dance there on December 4th in 1946. Many of the Yale groups met there after the football games. And so she also had apartments there. And she would drive down to New York and pick up these jazz musicians and bring them to New Haven. And she said, now you don't have to worry about your hotel. You're gonna stay in my apartment. You don't have to worry about your food. You're going to eat mine and it's very good. And so her restaurant was populated by all of these people and she continued that way. New Haven was lucky to be right in the middle between New York and Boston. So it was easy for her to say, I want you to stop here on your way up north or stop here on your way south. It was also, speaking of southern travel, listed in the Green Book as one of the safe places for African Americans to come for dinner, cocktails, and dancing. She attracted great musicians like Billie Holiday, who came to Lillian's Paradise, Lionel Hampton, Errol Garner, Johnny Ray, 
Um, and as I was talking to John Ragazzino, who lived next door, he told me he met Dorothy Dandridge at Lillian's Paradise. And so she came along with many, many others. Wild Man Steve was the MC. So this was dubbed Connecticut's Smartest Nightclub, right here in the Grand Avenue uh, neighborhood. I talked to her daughter, and oh, by the way, I've been going on and on, and I didn't tell you her full name, Lillian Benford Lumpkin, who lived life on her own terms. But I was able to talk to her daughter, who now lives in North Carolina, after a lot of, you know, called this one, who knew that one, who knew that one, who knew the other one, I finally got to the daughter, and she told me stories about all of these musicians who came into her mom's uh, nightclub and restaurant. Mrs. Lumpkin passed away at age 89, but isn't that wonderful to be able to say, I reached my goal, my dream was realized, just as I wanted it to be. So again, be your own boss, keep the faith, and run your race. What an inspiring way to end our program. I, I think that even though a lot of these buildings are no longer standing, these stories are still with us and we want to keep them alive.